The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I'm the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal gasoline is tops, too, tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Deal with death. For Scott Rainey, it all began with a question, one that had been on his mind all day. And as he hurried home that evening, each step seemed to fan the fires of jealousy that burned within him. There were always questions on Scott's mind, but this particular one had nothing to do with his work as a reporter for one of San Francisco's leading dailies. Rather, it involved his wife, Evelyn, and another reporter, Scott's longtime rival, a man named Matt Cregan. Now Scott was certain that the rivalry between them was no longer confined to the newspaper business. His wife, Evelyn, had been acting strangely for weeks. As Scott faced her in their small apartment, he spoke quietly. Evelyn. What is it, dear? Were you with Cregan at the El Prado bar yesterday afternoon? Why, no, Scott. Okay. Okay, Evelyn. Scott, where are you going? I guess it's all pretty boring. I guess. What is? Oh, listening to guys crying out their domestic troubles to you over the bar? Yeah, all goes with bartender and maybe you ain't got the trouble to think. She lied, didn't she? I saw her here with Cregan. Sure, but maybe she had a good reason. They've been friends for a long time, ain't they? Yeah, but... He did a lot for her when she was singing in clubs around town. Looked after her pretty well. Some of the spots she worked in was operated by guys that was plenty tough. She's, uh, pretty attractive, your wife. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't know about Evelyn's past. She didn't ask me about mine. That's how we got married, Gus. No questions asked. Fix me another drink, will you? Yeah, sure. Oh, I, uh, almost forgot. Uh, about an hour ago, there was a call for you. Any message? Mm, fella didn't leave one. Said he'd call back later. Well, I'm not sticking around much longer. Hiya, Gus. Oh, ow. It's about time. My dogs are killing me. Look, you're supposed to relieve me at 8 Hello, o'clock. Scott. Hi. Sure, sure, Gus. Only there was a roadblock. A little excitement down on the waterfront. What kind of excitement? Fire in one of them cheap hotels. You didn't stop to find out how it happened? Nah. I didn't want old Gus here to overwork. Yeah, it's the first time I'd ever bothered you. Yeah? I think I'll go down and have a look. What do I owe you, Gus? Uh, oh, you already caught the last one. Eh, always on the beat. Huh? A reporter is only as good as his last hot story. This one ought to be hot enough anyway. A fire. Huh? I'm sorry you came. <laughs> The story doesn't really interest you, does it, Scott? Just something to keep your mind off Evelyn. The jealousy you feel about her, uh, friendship with Matt Cregan. The fire at the cheap waterfront hotel is all over when you get there. Only a few people around, curiously looking on. In the lobby, you see someone you know. Lieutenant Shaw, a police detective. His reaction to seeing you is somewhat startling. Brownie! Oh, you were always good at figuring things, Lieutenant. That's the name, Scott Rainey. How did this happen? An explosion upstairs. Anybody hurt? Yeah. 
The man in room five is dead. Oh, what's his name? Well, his name, Lieutenant. Well, the hotel register gives the dead man's name as Rainey, Scott Rainey, and it also gives your home address. You stare at Lieutenant Shaw, then at the hotel register that he hands you. Your own name leaps up at you from the pages. And you wonder what it's all about. Who wrote your name there? And why? Tell you what I think, Scott. That explosion up there was premature. A booby trap that went off at dress rehearsal instead of the regular show. I don't get it. You might have right in the neck. You could have been the intended victim. Somebody figured on getting you up to that room. But why? That's the tough part. The rest is easy. There's enough evidence left to convince me it was a rigged up deal, wires connected to the wall heater. Hey, hey, wait a second. Huh? I got a call tonight. Gus's bar. Some guy said he'd call back. Maybe he never got the chance. He may be the guy who was setting the trap, only it went off in his face. He was probably going to get you over here on a phony tip. What was he after? Was he trying to kill me? Frame me? What? Listen, Scott. Uh, maybe this sounds crazy to you, but I have an idea. How about playing dead for a while? Playing dead? Uh, just keeping out of sight for a day or two. Give us a chance to dig deeper into this thing, figure out what it's all about. Yeah, but a couple of guys know I'm not dead. Gus and Al, the two bartenders at the El Prado. Oh, we'll handle them all right. The person who'll do the worrying is the one who planned this thing. Let's not give it away until you think it over. Oh, here they come. Duck into this room. I'll talk to the other reporters. Go on inside. Well, hiya, boys. What can I do for you? Uh, anything big to this waterfront fire, Lieutenant? How come you're looking into it? Not a homicide, is it? <laughs> The voices of the lieutenant's questioners drift over the transom to you. You recognize them all. Reporters, Carter, Benson, Legrand. And then one voice cuts through, the most familiar one of all. What leads it? It's the voice of Matt Cregan, isn't it, Scott, your old rival? Have you made any identification yet, Lieutenant? Uh, maybe we have, Cregan, but whether we have or not, we aren't ready to release anything. Well, what name was the guy registered under? We're not revealing that either. So, you know, huh? Okay, have it your way, Lieutenant. I can wait. Not worried about being scooped by your old pal? What do you mean? Scott Rainey. Oh. Oh, no, I'm not worried. Or isn't he a pal? Funny he isn't around. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Now, he probably will be. Yeah. Maybe so, Lieutenant. Maybe so. <laughs> Something in Cregan's tone bothers you, doesn't it, Scott? He isn't worried at all. You're sure of it. And suddenly you've made up your mind about something else. When the other reporters have gone, you have an answer ready for the lieutenant. I've decided to string along with you, lieutenant. I'll play dead for a while. Just tell me what to do. You don't do anything, Scott. Just keep out of sight. The body will remain unidentified. We'll let whoever did this sweat a while. He might get careless, make a mistake. When we break the case, the story is all yours. Okay, lieutenant. But the story is only part of what I'm after. With the prologue of Deal with Death, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. If, like most car owners, you'll be using tomorrow's holiday for a drive somewhere, you'll also be seeing a lot of Signal service stations. So it occurred to me that you might like to know a little more about this friendly organization which brings you the Whistler. Well, first of all, signal products have always been sold only through independently operated stations. The reason? Signal Oil Company believes that a man who has his own business naturally has more incentive to serve you better. And secondly, because you want top quality products for your car, each individual signal station is backed by an organization which serves the many hundreds of signal dealers throughout six western states with facilities to bring you every latest advance in petroleum science. Obviously, drivers must like this combination of signals' personalized service plus fine quality signal products when you consider how fast signal has grown into an organization serving the entire west coast from border to border. To see for yourself one of the good reasons for this increasing popularity, Drop into a signal station tomorrow. Fill up your tank and discover how you go farther with signal. Well, 
Well, Scott, you've decided, haven't you? Agreed to play dead for Lieutenant Shaw to give him an opportunity to investigate the strange motive behind the explosion in the Waterfront Hotel in an attempt to kill you. There's something intriguing about the whole idea, isn't there? Keeping out of sight, sitting back, watching, waiting for development. And you'll be especially interested in the reaction of two people, Matt Cregan and your wife, Evelyn. Look, Scott, I'm going back to headquarters and see how the boys are coming along with the dead man's prints. You'd better duck out of sight. Okay. There's an apartment on Ellis Street. I made arrangements to hide you there. Here's the address and the key. Thank you. I'll call you the minute I find out anything. If we're lucky, we'll have the dead man's prints on fire. All right, Lieutenant. I'm sort of anxious to know who he is. It's important to you, isn't it, Scott, to know who the dead man is? The man you're certain set the death trap for you in that waterfront hotel room. But more important is Matt Cregan. And on your way to the hideout, you see him walking up the street ahead of you. You follow Cregan as he wanders around the waterfront district, looking into one bar, then another. At one place, the Golden Hawk Bar, he stays there for over an hour, and then finally he comes out and continues his round. He's searching for someone, isn't he, Scott? Finally, Matt returns to his flat on Washington Street. You're more than a little annoyed to see the lights in his apartment go out, and you know he's gone to bed. A quarter of an hour later, you enter a small apartment building on Ellis Street, the address Lieutenant Shaw gave you. As you open the door... Scott! Why the... Oh, Lieutenant. Where have you been? I was just scouting around. That could be dangerous. I told you to stay out of sight. Sure, sure. You ever hear of Dino Corelli? A gambler? Sure, I've heard of him. Don't know him, though. No, should I? Well, he's the guy we pulled out of that hotel fire. The man who registered in that room under your name. Corelli? Mm Mm-hmm. Lieutenant, I thought Corelli was still up at San Quentin. Got out a couple of months ago. Been floating around town since then, picking up odd jobs here and there. You think somebody hired him to set that trap up for me tonight? Could be. Hey, wait a minute. That doesn't figure. Corelli was a gambler, a big gambler, not a trigger man. Corelli was a big man once, but when he got out of prison two months ago, he was just another guy, a nobody, and without dough. Maybe he wanted to pick up a few bucks. Still doesn't make sense. Maybe this will. We checked up on him. Found he once served a prison term back east for a bank job. In his early days, Corelli's was an expert with explosives, a soup artist. Oh, that does sort of make a difference. Yeah. My hunch is, of course, I may be wrong, but it's possible somebody hired Corelli to kill you, Scott. Now, do you see why it's important you keep out of sight? Sure. Whoever tried to have you killed will probably try it again when he finds out this attempt failed. So if you are smart, you'll stay in this apartment. What's that? Oh, never mind, Scott. It's one of my boys out front. I told him to pick me up. Okay, Lieutenant. I'll let you know how we make out. We're going to start hitting a few of Corelli's hangouts, starting with the Golden Hawk. The the Golden Hawk? Yeah, you know where it is? Yeah, I know. It's beginning to add up, isn't it, Scott? The Golden Hawk Bar, one of Corelli's hangouts. And that's where Matt Cregan went tonight, looking for Corelli. You're sure he's involved in the attempt on your life, aren't you, Scott? You're certain Cregan's in love with your wife. But there's no proof of it yet. And that's what you need, proof, before you can make your move to handle Cregan in your own way. You pick up the telephone and dial. Too dangerous for you to leave the apartment, so you're going to need someone to help you. The sort of help that a police informer like Jerry Harris can give you. Hello? Hello? Just a second, will you, baby? Uh, hello? Jerry, this is Scott Rainey. Oh, hi. What's up? Don't let anybody know you've talked to me, Jerry. I've got a little job for you. Well, look, pal, I, uh, I'm uh, sort of tied up at the moment, uh, baby. Well, uh, this can wait till morning, but that's all. Uh, morning, huh? Well, uh, I got some things on fire for tomorrow, pal. I don't think I'll be able to... Still on to... parole, aren't you, Jerry? Why? There are certain things guys on parole are not supposed to do, Jerry. You get what I mean? Uh, I think so. <clears throat> what do you want me to do? Nothing that could hurt you. Just tail a guy, Matt Cregan. Cregan? The reporter? Yeah. Let me know what he does, where he goes, who he sees, that's all. And keep your mouth shut. Okay. Keep in touch with me at this number. Lafayette, 8971. Have you got it? Yeah, I got it.
You lie awake most of that night, don't you, Scott? Thinking about it all. Cregan, the death trap, and Corelli. Again, your thoughts turn to your wife, Evelyn, and you wonder what part she had in the attempt on your life. Or if it was just Cregan's idea. As you stare out of the window and watch the first gray streaks of dawn sweep in over the sleeping city, your thoughts go back to Corelli's trial. Ten years ago, wasn't it? You lean back in the heavy chair, close your eyes. You remember the trial well. Matt Cregan, covering the case, was the only reporter who believed Corelli's story, and he played it up big. Perhaps that's the reason why Corelli was willing to return Cregan's favor and set up your death trap. Yes, that's what you're thinking about when somehow you doze off. It's almost noon when the phone wakens you. It's Jerry with a report on Cregan. At first, Cregan dropped around to your own newspaper. Then he hit a half a dozen restaurants. Spent a couple of hours at the Hall of Justice. Then back to his paper. Then out to your house. My house? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, then what? Well, he's still there. I'm calling from the drugstore on the corner. All right, stay with him. Cregan checking up on you, isn't he, Scott? As long as the body at the morgue remains unidentified, he doesn't know for certain if you're really dead. Then throughout the day, there are more calls from Jerry. He's still on the move, Scott. One bar after another. Bowling alleys, restaurants, pool halls. Half a dozen times today, he's been to the same apartment on Bush Street. Whoever he's calling on here, don't answer. He's at the El Prado bar now, Scott. Your wife is with him. Reagan's still looking, Scott, only now I know who he's looking for, a guy called Dino Corelli. That explains why Cregan's been trying that apartment on Bush Street all day. That where Corelli lives? Well, not officially. To the law, he's got a furnished room on Fillmore. Only what they don't know is that Corelli has another place to hang his hat. A little apartment on Bush, listed under the name of Carr. What's the address? 671, apartment 3. Okay. Uh, where are you now? At the Palm Grill. Just a couple of blocks down the street from you. The Cregan's having his dinner. But don't let him out of your sight. I... Yeah? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all, Jerry. It hits you suddenly, doesn't it, Scott? All Jerry has is the phone number of your hideout. Yet he knows where it is. He said he was calling from a restaurant only a few blocks away from you. You wonder if Jerry is planning to double-cross you. You've got to find out now dark out and you decide to chance it. You leave the apartment, hurry down the street, and finally you're standing in a darkened storefront across the street from the cafe. You've only a few minutes to wait, and then you see Cregan and Jerry come out. Cregan is doing the talking. You've made a mistake, haven't you, Scott? Calling in Jerry to help you. A few minutes later, you see Cregan get into a cab and drive off. Jerry turns and walks away. On a darkened side street, you catch up to him. Just a second, Jerry. Hey, what? Oh, Scott. What were you and Cregan Joan about back then? Oh, uh, well, yeah, he, he, got, he, he got wise. He told me to quit telling him or he'd suck my ears down. How did you know I was in that apartment on Ellis? Oh, that? Oh, that's easy. I, I remember the phone number. I was up to the apartment a couple of times doing a little job for Lieutenant Shaw. Okay. How did Cregan tumble to you? Well, I, uh... I guess I got too close to that uh, phone booth, and he spotted me. He was calling somebody? Yeah. Some dame kept calling him honey. From what I overheard, he's figuring on blowing town with her tonight. I heard him say he had two tickets for the 11 o'clock plane. Oh, leaving town, huh? Listen, Jerry, meet me at Corelli's apartment right away. Well, what do you want me for? Well, apartments usually have locks. I can use your talents. <laughs> Jerry opens Corelli's apartment easily. You search the place thoroughly, but there isn't a single clue here to link Cregan with Corelli. All you find is a 45 automatic. You slip it into your pocket, glance at your watch. Only two hours left before Cregan catches his plane, and you're pretty sure you know who the second ticket's for. There's nothing else to do, is there, Scott? You've got to face him, have it out, before he gets away. <laughs> Shortly before 9.30, you enter the apartment house where Cregan lives. The hand in your pocket tightens around the gun as you hurry up the stairs. 
And you wonder what he'll say when he sees you. He's in for a shock, isn't he, Scott, when he discovers you're still alive. And then as you reach for the doorbell at his apartment, something you hear stops your hand in midair. A laugh. A woman's laugh coming from the inside. Well, 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 Scott Rainey, boy reporter. Hiya, sourpuss. Come on in. I've been looking for you. What? Yeah, I wanted you to be the first to know. Right now, I'm the happiest guy in the world, Scott, and I owe it all to you. <laughs> I knew that'd break your heart. What are you talking about? Hey, honey, look who's here. Well, hello, Scott. You remember Vicky Grant, don't you, pal? You should. You introduced us a couple of months back. Remember? I uh, twisted your arm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. Say, you're just in time to have a going-away drink with us. Going away? Sure. Uh -huh. Vicky and I are getting married, pal. Come on, have a drink. Let's bury the hatchet. Tonight, I love everybody. <laughs> Even you, Sourpuss. <laughs> Don't mind him, Scott. Matt keeps telling me you're the best reporter in town. Of course he is. Hey, look, Scott. To show you my heart's in the right place, I'm going to give you a tip. You heard about that fire in the hotel on the waterfront. Fire? Yeah, the police say they haven't identified the body, but I know better. I also had a few good contacts at the morgue. The guy's name is Corelli, Dino Corelli. Oh? My spies also tell me he's got a little hideout on Bush Street under another name. Might be a big story there, pal. It's all yours. I'm too busy getting married. Scott, where are you going? Hey, hey wait a minute. How about that drink? As you have run down the stairs, you realize you've been all wrong, haven't you, Scott? You were quick, eager to jump to the conclusion that Matt Cregan had hired Corelli to kill you. Certain Matt wanted you out of the way so he could marry your wife, Evelyn. But it hasn't turned out that way, has it? You had it all figured out, and you were completely wrong. As you reach the street, you realize, too, that now you'll have to start all over, that you're no nearer to the answer than you were last night. Back at the apartment on Ellis Street, the hideout furnished you by Lieutenant Shaw. You pace the floor for hours, trying to think it out, struggling to find the motive behind the attempt on your life. And then... Yeah? Jerry again. After I let you in Corelli's apartment, I played a hunch and went over to the Golden Hawk to see if Corelli and Cregan never got together there. Well, it seems not. But Corelli spent most of his time talking to some dame. Oh? Uh -huh. Know who she is? Well, the bartender ain't sure. But he liked to really call the dame by her first name several times. What, uh, what is it? The dame's name is Evelyn. Uh, you still there, pal? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Well, what now, Scott? Scott. Now, one more thing, then I won't need you anymore, Jerry. Call up my home. And tell my wife that Corelli wants to see her at his place right away. Uh, don't give her the address. Yeah? Don't tell her who you are. Just give her the message and hang up. Okay, but, but I don't get it. No, I guess you don't. But I think Evelyn will. The whistle will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Cars are a convenience any time. But just as it takes a long holiday weekend like this to make you fully appreciate how much fun a car can be, it also takes a top-quality gasoline to make you fully aware of how much performance your car has in it. That's why I'd like to suggest that before you get out on the highway tomorrow, you fill up with signal gasoline. You'll have some pleasant surprises in store for you. Well, naturally, you'll enjoy excellent mileage. Mileage that has made signal famous from Canada to Mexico as the go-farther gasoline. But in addition, you'll discover other benefits from the extra efficiency today's signal gasoline coaxes from your motor. Benefits such as smarter pickup and smoother power. Yes, mileage and performance do go hand in hand. So for the tops in driving pleasure, fill up with signal and go farther. <laughs> All along, you were certain that Matt Cregan was involved in the attempt to kill you, weren't you, Scott? Certain he had hired Corelli to set up the death trap. But you were wrong. And now he's out of it. That leaves one person, Evelyn. Yes. You're sure it was your wife and Corelli who plotted your death in that cheap waterfront hotel. That it had been Corelli all along. Hard to imagine your wife in love with a man like Corelli. But as your friend Gus the bartender said... 
She'd been thrown with some pretty tough characters in her work as a nightclub singer before you'd known her. One thing you're sure of. When Jerry phoned her to meet you at Corelli's, he didn't give her Corelli's address. If she comes, it means she's been there before. As you sit in Corelli's apartment waiting for her, you stare at the gun on the table at your elbow and then at your watch. It's been over an hour now since she received the message. Come in. Scott, what are you doing here? Surprised, baby. You watch her as she stands in the doorway. A puzzled look on her face. And then suddenly something happens to you, doesn't it, Scott? A moment ago, you were going to kill her. But now your hands remain motionless in your lap. You find you love her so much you can't reach for the gun on the table. Oh, darling, you had me worried sick. Where have you been? I guess I should have told you before, Mrs. Rainey. Scott was working for me. Oh, oh. Tell it. How about I'd better come along, Scott? Right now, Mrs. Rainey, I think you'd better explain something to him. You mean Corelli. Evelyn, what's this all about? Oh, darling, I didn't want you to know, ever. Your wife got a phone call tonight, Scott. She came right down to headquarters and told me the whole setup. You don't know this, Scott, but a long time ago, your wife was Corelli's girlfriend. What? Yes, you see, I was just a kid. I didn't know what he did, how he made his money. And when I found out, I stopped seeing him. But he kept hounding me. And then I heard he went to prison. When he got out a couple of months ago, he started in again. He wanted me to go away with him, to leave you. He threatened me, said if I didn't, The he'd... threat, Scott, was murder. He told your wife he'd kill you if she didn't go away with him. Evelyn. You see now why I was so worried. I didn't know what to do, darling. I went to Matt Cregan for help. That's when I met him at the El Prado bar. And he promised to do all he could. Well, it's all over. We know now that no one hired Corelli to kill you. The booby trap was his own idea. Guess you'd get a forget about it. But I still don't understand, Lieutenant. That phone call I got tonight to come to Corelli's. Who... I think you can forget about that, too, Mrs. Rainey. It was probably some crank's idea. Wouldn't you say so, Scott? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Lieutenant. A crank. <laughs> some, uh, poor dope. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Frank Lovejoy and Ted DeCorsia. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Steve Hampton, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>